move on to uh, another one of my favorite examples of theoretical functional morphology, and that has to do with trees, um, which we haven't talked about uh, too much on this course, and so I really like spending time talking a little bit about trees um, and plants in this section, um, because trees and plants in general are fundamentally different than animals. There's a huge diversity of trees, and we've talked about how um, different types of uh, clades have, have formed trees through Earth history. We talked about that a little bit last week, like lycopods formed trees and <clears throat> giant tree ferns, and then we, of course we have our gymnosperms and angiosperms. And all of these organisms have similar needs. They need to intercept light in order to photosynthesize. They need to reproduce, which means that they need to disperse seeds or spores in some way. And they need to stay upright, so they need to have mechanical stability. And so if we think about the earliest plants, so this is a model and a fossil of the um, early Paleozoic plant Coxonia, which is basically just a photosynthesizing stem with little spore cups on the top. Uh, we can think about how um, trees evolved from this type of a structure, which was only maybe a centimeter or two high, to the broad diversity of trees that we see in the rest of the Phanerozoic end today. And so this was work done by Carl Nicholas in the 90s, and he took a sort of similar approach to Raup. He made a theoretical morphology of trees modeling uh, via their three needs. And so he made a, a physical model that took into account things like branching, how far away branches were, so like the angle of branches, um, and how much rotation there was between branches, so sort of in a three-dimensional space. And so then he ran a bunch of models that optimized for different needs. So this is the model for optimizing reproduction. So this was a computer model that was made on a, you know, early 1990s computer. Um, so this thing on the left is a little confusing. It's basically a visualization of how the optimization in the program worked. So each of these tiny little circles represents like one step in the theoretical morphous space um, that the model took. And then it moves up towards an optimum and then basically stops. And so um, basically this is the form that you get to optimize reproduction. You want all your spores and seeds way up high so that presumably um, most spores and seeds are, are distributed by, by wind. Of course, many are distributed by animals today, um, that they will be uh, distributed most, most broadly. And so this is only optimizing for reproduction. If we optimize for light interception, we get a very different tree morphology. We get these broad trees, okay, that have lots of branchings and then the branches stick straight out so that the leaves intercept as much light as possible. And here we can see that there are actually more than one uh, basically equally optimum morphologies that led to the same optimum light interception, which is why we have a couple of these little squiggles here um, in this morphospace. space. Similarly, for optimizing mechanical stability, if you want to optimize just mechanical stability, you don't want to have branches sticking out because that puts you off balance. If it's windy, um, that uh, those branches can get caught by the wind and, and decrease your stability. So here, similarly, there's three equally about equally optimum um, models that the program came up with, which are represented by these three little paths through the theoretical morphous space. So none of these actually look like real trees, do they? Um, so the really cool thing that Nicholas did is then he took the uh, summary of a single variable optima um, and he started uh, mixing them together. So this is um, a mixture of reproductive success and mechanical stability. Um, and this is a uh, the model that shows light interception and mechanical stability. So we're starting to see shapes that look a little bit more like the trees we have. And the other really important thing to note is that there's actually more optimums and the sizes of these black um, circles is basically like how, um, how optimum they are. So there's more uh, peaks in our fitness landscape, going back to our, our fitness landscape analogy that we talked about a few weeks ago. Um, this is reproductive success in light interception. And this is definitely the coolest. So when you combine all three of them, all of a sudden um, you start getting morphologies that look a lot more similar to trees that you would see outside today. And there's a lot more morphologies that are basically equally optimum in the fitness landscape. So we go from like one peak in the fitness landscape here to um, many, many peaks in the fitness landscape here. And it turns out that all of these peaks are a little bit less optimum than when we just had one variable. So if we think back to like the Cambrian 
explosion example, we talked about like fitness landscapes and roughening of fitness landscapes. Um, that's a very similar thing to what we're seeing. So we go from um, multitask landscapes to single task landscapes. Um, and we can see how we get more of these um, optimum as we move through time. But it turns out that the peaks are actually lower. So A is showing um, basically the height of a peak when you just have uh, a single task to complete. And then B and C are showing what happens to the peaks um, as you, the coarsening of the landscape um, increases as you have more fitness needs that you need to achieve. And so I really love this model. I think that's a really interesting and new way to think about trees. And it actually models some of the things that we see in the fossil record as well. And it gives us a different way to think about how the morphology of trees um, and more generally other organisms is affected by, um, by their functional needs.